All right, to review what was covered in chapter two, which is also gonna overlap with your text tomorrow. By simplify, it's literally make it look more simple. When you see equations like this or expressions like this, simplify would mean number one, let's do distributive property and multiply it out. We'll get the brackets out of the way. And once we have all these terms, we're going to group like terms. Three times M, three M. Three times two is a six. Five times M, five M. Five times negative two, negative 10. Okay. A question like this would be easily one mark, possibly two, but probably just one. Why? I expect you to be able to do multiplications. That's not a grade 11 thing. From there, you group like terms. Three plus five, because those are like terms. Remember what I mean, we said before about like terms. And the six and the 10 without any variables are like terms. So that's your final answer. I'm gonna continue because again, this is not the first time you've seen it. I don't think I need to spend too much time on it. 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times 2 without me drawing arrows, because you should see these arrows, imaginary arrows in your head. Negative 3 times x squared. Negative 3 times 2. Negative 3 times negative 4. And when you group the like terms together, again, maybe you need some color coordination, but I'm going to move on because it's not the first time you see it. Okay. Six x squared and the four x, six x, and, and so on. Well, I was surprised there was a couple of you, not, not too many, but a couple of you who actually did the factoring first, maybe because it was fresh in your mind. Remember, these two things are not necessarily technique, it's just it's, it's gonna be the bread and butter. Like you, you don't, when, it, when you eat, you don't think of your ability to use a spoon or a fork as a technique to eat, right? Like you, what, what's a technique you would need for food when you're like shucking, shucking like clams or whatever? I don't know, what's a technique for food? Maybe even cooking, I don't know. But when it comes to math, this is literally like the ABCs. We need to be able to do them to do bigger and better things. Please work hard to make this proficient. Factoring. Grouping like terms, two numbers that will multiply to 10, but add to a negative 11. So let's write that first. Do, 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 do. Well, luckily, 10 is either 1 and 10 or 2 and 5. Negative 1, 10 and negative 1 will get you a negative 11 while multiplying to a positive. The second one was me just annoying, annoyingly trying to be tricky. Please note, I am going to rearrange it so that the X terms decreasing in exponent value from one to or decreasing in degree, right? Two, one, and zero. Next, can I common factor this? Yeah, I'm not gonna do the trinomial just yet. Why not just make my life easier by having no number in front of the x squared. Again, it's not, your, it's not that you're looking at a question like, how do I solve this? What's the puzzle? No, it's just do whatever you can to make your life easier and then try to, you know, get this baby steps, try to figure it out. So the next question is, can I factor this any further? I see a trinomial. Are there two numbers that multiply to a three but add to a negative one? The answer is no. And so you're done. You can't factor any further, that's it. Done. Yes. And lastly, I saw Nessica do this, right? She recognized that this was one of the special cases. It was the very last lesson we did together. When you have a binomial, it's like, hey, that's not a trinomial. How the heck am I supposed to do the, uh, 
find two numbers to multiply to that, but add to the middle number. Recognize, because they are both perfect squares, it's going to be plus and minus the same binomial. They're conjugates. So all of that would be chapter two. This is literally chapter two. These five questions, <laughs> well, I lied. There is one more. That is when there is a number in front of the x squared. How do you factor that, right? That's the last piece. That's 2.4, the biggest one, okay? Any questions on, on this so far? Now that you see it, you're like, oh, I, yeah. You have to be able to say the, oh, I remember by yourself. You can't wait for the answer and be like, I remember that. It'll be too late. Remember, the whole goal is for you to be able to do this, whether I'm around or not. So I hope you'll be able to. Any questions before I move on? Because the next part is a bit of a refresher from potentially grade nine and grade 10. Can I move on? We'll get back to this. All right, clear. Remember, I want to get through this as fast as I can because I want to um, give you some time to study. Let's see what we can do. Determine the x and y intercepts. Recall x intercepts have y equals zero and y intercepts have x equals zero. What I mean by x intercepts, remember, if I have a graph, here is where the line cuts through my y axis. And here is where the line cuts through my x axis. I want to know what number that is, and I, know want to, I want to know what number that is. What's interesting is, what's the x value for my y axis? The x value here is zero, because it's right in the middle. Here, what's my y value for my x intercept? The y axis, a uh, y value is a zero, because there's no height. It's not high, it's not low, it's right in the middle. Okay, so here's what we do. Determine, let's do the x-intercept first. If the x-intercept is what we're looking for, we can say that y is going to be zero. Therefore, for this equation, zero equals three x minus seven. Does this ring a bell? You should have seen stuff like this in grade nine and 10. Does it ring a bell where if you want the x-axis, you make the y a zero. If you want the y-axis, you want the, excuse me. If you want the x-intercept, you make the y a zero. If you may want the y-intercept, you want to make the x zero. Does that sound familiar to anyone? I see a couple of nods. I see some shaking heads. Okay, well, this is going to be a new technique for you, I suppose, then, for some of you, right? I'm going to make the y value a zero because I'm looking for the x-intercept. 0 equals 3x minus 7. Let's do some algebra. Add 7 to both sides. And then I'm going to divide by a 3 to get x all alone. 7 over 3. So my x-intercept is when x is 7 over 3, my y value is a 0. In the same way, if I'm looking for the y-intercept, that means my x value is a zero. So let's plug in it, what x equals zero. y is equal to three times a zero minus a seven. Well, anything times a zero is a seven, so we've got this. You see what I mean? If I'm looking for the x-intercept, the y is a zero. If I'm looking for the y-intercept, the x is a zero. Right here, y equals, sorry, that's a three. I'm just copying the equation. That's three x minus seven, right? So instead of three x, it's three zero minus seven. Maybe I'll color coordinate a little bit more. So that, that y equals zero, which means the y equals zero. If the x equals zero, it means the x equals zero, right?
Okay. Continuing on then, oh, some people might do. Graphing. This is another reminder back to grade nine, and a little bit of grade 10, right? But mostly grade nine. When you are graphing, we typically love to have the equation in the form of y equals mx plus b. Why? Because if we have it in this form, the special numbers m and b tell us something about the graph, the line rather. The B is automatically the y-intercept. And the M is what we call a slope. That is, if you remember, do you remember the words rise over run? That should be a full chapter. People remember rise over run? So here we go. B value is a negative two. That means my y-intercept is a negative two. Next, the slope is a three or it's equal to three over one. What does that mean? It means my three is the one that goes up or down and it's a positive three, so it's going up. And my run going left and right, in this case, it's a positive one, so we're going right, is a one. So what we're going to do, or typically what I would have told my students in grade nine is, let's start at a point and what better point to start than the y-intercept. And then we're gonna start moving from that point, three up, and one across, three up, one across, three up, one across, rinse and repeat. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Yes, yes, absolutely. So let me move this up a little bit. I'm going to shift all the data so that you can still see our calculations. Okay. Okay. I think you should see enough. Here we go. Starting with, let's see if I could use a, a different color, maybe a green, maybe that shows up nicely. A negative, you know, color code. Why intercept is a negative two. So that's my negative two, zero negative two. I'll just write it here. Zero negative two. From there, let's use my blue. Literally, do a staircase count with me. We're changing by a certain rate, a rate of change. Three up, one right. Three up, one right. Next point. 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 This slope tells you how the line is moving. So writing it as a y equals mx plus b is a really helpful way, really, I guess, streamlined, simple way to draw a line. So, Let's see your own opinions. Like maybe just grab a sheet first. Let's have your opinion. Which parts, which part would be the most helpful? Like you can't really draw a line without both in pieces of information, but just because you have the slope, yes, slope is important, but having certain accuracy points is just as important. Like if we did not have this zero negative two, we wouldn't even know where to start or where to begin drawing our line. The same is going to apply to quadratics. So in the following pages, I'm gonna ask you to look at a graph 
and look very carefully at some of the numbers I give you, and then take a look at my function and see if you see some kind of similarity or not. That's the only goal I have for you today. Yes. Right. Any questions with the straight line? Because all of these, again, you spent, you probably spent the full year just talking about lines, right? We're going to try to see similar properties of quadratics to help us understand what the graph, uh, what the equation might look like and vice versa. Any questions? No? All right, here we go again. I'm gonna go at it relatively fast so that you have time to study today and just relax even, or organize your, your notes before you go. So you, all you have to do tonight is study. Here we go. Uh, investigate. Key features of graphs, such as X and Y intercepts, usually tell a story when we apply to real life situations. Like for example, if this was um, the trajectory of someone diving into a pool, what do you think the two and the six represent? If this was a this was a swimming pool, okay. What does that represent? Yep. Entry and exit, right? Yes, it doesn't make any sense that if a person was to dive into the water, that they would fly back out like they were Superman. That doesn't make sense. I understand. That I get. However, Mathematically speaking, if this was supposed to model the movement of the person, then you can say, yeah, the x-intercepts mathematically is just x-intercepts. But realistically, it means entry and exit. Being able to tell that story is really important. That's essentially why we have math. We're using numbers to calculate, and then we use those numbers to tell a story afterwards. So in this picture, follow along with me, what are the x-intercepts of this function? No, not a trick question. What are, yes. Right here, right? Say two or three. It would be, that would be a two. So we have zero, we have one, and the x-intercepts are two, zero, and six, zero. And please notice, what are the y, what are the y coordinates? every single time, right? It's always going to be a zero, just like we practiced in the, in the first page. Now, again, compare the numbers you gave me right here. So I'm gonna do it in red here. Compare the numbers you gave me, two and six, with the numbers in the equation. Do you notice a coincidence? And if you do, how would you describe this coincidence? Someone in their own words, other than Charlie, just because she was brave enough this morning. And then as well, someone else. Look at the x-intercepts we wrote and look at the equation we used. Or you could look at the equation for that graph. What's the coincidence? Yes, Kaylee. Right. So I don't like the idea that it magically switches. So assuming the numbers are still positive, what can you, how would you describe this coincidence? Well, no, just straight up. If the two is still a two and the six is still a six, what are we doing with the two and the six? No, what I was trying to get you to think about is assuming that they are positive at two and six, how would you describe it? The X intercepts look like they are subtracting from the X in the equation, something like that. Okay. Is there a better way to word this? Um, in the equation, the X intercepts look like they Subtract from X, I guess. Let's see if I could make that a little bigger. 
And let's do that in nice dark green letters or something. And as you copy this down, if you have it copied, I'd like you to take a look at part C and confirm whether this is true. I took the liberty of putting in the equations you see underneath each graph into desmos.com and then screenshotting it. What do you notice? Is this coincidence how you described it? Is it true? Does it hold up? And look, is it true here? The x-intercept is a three and a five, subtracting three and subtracting five. Yeah, here with the x-intercept is one and five. Oh, sorry, one and eight. Well, in the equation, don't worry about the a value here, right? That's like an a value times this, right? It looks like it's subtracted by one and it looks like it's subtracted by eight. Was that a mistake on the inverse? Nope. Oh, did I write five? Yes, yeah, that's supposed to be an A. That's my bad. Clearly that's an A. That's my bad. Okay. So yeah, one and eight. Take a look here. Ooh, this time I have a negative three and I have a positive three. Well, that positive three is being subtracted by a strict factor from X. And my negative three is being subtracted from x, which makes sense. x minus a negative three, right? It's like x plus three. So if it looks like a positive, that means there must be a negative x-intercept. With this in mind, can you try it? Don't worry, as I said, do not worry about the a value, the number that's being multiplied into the front, because this will tell you just like our transformations, if the parabola is going to be stretched or smushed or compressed. Judging just from the x-intercept, can you match the letters I for one, two, three, and four with these graphs? I'll give you four minutes, one minute each. Go. All right. That was about four minutes. Let's do it. I Again, this is how simple I am approaching this. I see a subtraction of four. So I'm looking for an x-intercept of four. Mm, that's the only one. Now let's confirm. If the other one is an x-intercept of negative two, I am subtracting a negative two, which looks like it's a positive. There you go. This is i. Move on. I'm looking for a positive six because it's subtracting with six. Done. The other one is a three. Do I see a subtraction of three? I do. Done. So this must be two. That's as simple as we can look at it. Very straightforward. Now, I intentionally made another next two a little bit harder because I have a two and a one. I have a two and a one. Both of them have positive two and a positive one. Where are we going, right? The only way we can tell the difference then is looking at the A values. Let's not worry about whether it's a whole number or a fraction. Look, there's one of them being a negative. Using your knowledge from transformations back in chapter one, what does that tell you? That the A value is negative. Do you remember? It's, yeah, it's opening down. That's it. So we have two, one, and we're looking for the parabola that's opening downwards. This is four, which leaves this to be three. That's it. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Give me a quick sec. Just gotta update the tendons for a little bit. So, 
All right. There we go. Okay, which brings us to the very last bit. Um, I am. So this is the quick explanation of why that makes sense. Okay. But I think what I'm going to do is save this explanation for after our test, because I do want to leave the rest of class for you to study for tomorrow's test. So um, your homework, I guess, for today is supposed to be studying. I wanted to do this in class. Yeah. Let's save this. I'm going to use this last page as a way to uh, introduce our Wednesday's lesson. Okay, so I'll pause this video and stop this video for now. And we will uh, use the rest of the time to study. Okay.